What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, whatever, what you're waiting for, hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting mafia topic. And as we know, the name Gotti has been synonymous with the American mafia for decades. John Gotti Sr. etched his way to the top of one of the most powerful criminal syndicates in America. Four of his brothers would follow him into the life that he once set out to be a part of. As we know, his brother Peter would ultimately at one point take over control of the family his brother once led. After his incarceration and his son's incarceration, Peter would take over. He would go away in 2005, and we'll get to some of that later in this video. Also, as we know, Brother Gene would enter into the life as well. And he would once, at one point, be a high-level heroin trafficker in the Gambino crime family. And that would get him a 50-year prison sentence in the federal prison system. There were two other brothers, though, associated with the mafia. We don't hear about them much. Why is that? We're going to get into it today. The story of Vincent and Richard Gotti. Next on Sit Down Shorts, Vinnie Gotti was born in 1952. By the early 50s, the Gotti family would move from the Bronx, New York, over to East New York, Brooklyn. And in 1952, the youngest brother would be born. Uh, Vincent Gotti would spend most of his childhood in East New York, Brooklyn. Now, uh, by his teenage years, he had already developed a criminal record. In 1973, he'd be arrested for petty theft. And by that point, he had largely delved in to the world of narcotics. He had regularly been known to abuse drugs. And that would be one thing that really would bother him his entire life. And this would, at one point, ban him not only uh, from the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, but the Ravenite Social Club as well. According to FBI agent George Gabriel, at one point in 1992, he would say this about Vincent Gotti, quote, Vincent had no place within the family organization. He was chased away as an embarrassment due to the stupid things he had done in the past. Uh, and that was said in a document in a parole file about Vincent Gotti. He would also say that John Gotti Sr., quote, abhorred drug users. And it wasn't for moral reasons, but for security reasons, the security of the family. Now, this can be a bit hypocritical because as we know, John Gotti regularly allowed certain members of his own family to sell drugs. But one thing is for sure, Vincent Gotti was largely looked at as the black sheep of the family. Now, for large parts of Vincent Gotti's life, it is unknown what he actually did as a legitimate source of income. At one point, he was listed as a shop steward of a union local, 23 in New York. It was also at one point pretty well known uh, that he had other various jobs, including a job at a phone company. Now, at one point in a court case, it was alleged that for many years of his what life, he would actually act as, quote, a homemaker, according to his lawyer. He was said to be a good father of his daughter and son, and they lived on Long Island. But it was very well known, according to the lawyer of Vinny Gotti, that his wife was the breadwinner of their family. Now, he would kind of be hard up in the family. He was known as pretty much an associate. And up until 2002, um, he was really just an associate. At that point, uh, John Sr. would pass away. Uh, Junior was way out of the life. And Peter Gotti was in control. At that point, the family was hard up for members. And who better to go to if you're Peter Gotti than your brothers? In 2002, Vincent Gotti would, uh, according to the government, be inducted into the Gambino crime family. This is where he would get a little bit more active as far as mob crimes. It was said at one point that he got into shy locking and had some illegal gambling as well. We wouldn't really hear much about 
Vinny Gotti uh, in the 2000s. But this is when really the federal government would continue to rain an assault down on the Gambino crime family. As we know, the goals of the government were to get Gotti Jr. and Gotti Sr. out of the way. They then would set their sights on the rest of the hierarchy of the Gambino crime family. And as we discussed in a video up here about Charles Carniglia, he alongside high-level brass in the Gambino crime family would be all arrested in 2008 in an indictment called Operation Old Bridge. In that case, uh, 50 Gambino crime family members would be arrested in an 80-count indictment. Members involved in that indictment were said to be Jackie Nose D'Amico, Dominic Italian Dom Sheffalu, Consigliere Jojo Carrazzo, Charles Carniglia, and also Vinny Gotti. Vinny Gotti would be indicted in this as well. He would actually be seen alongside Richard Gotti, but it was not the Richard Gotti that we will talk about here in just a moment. This was actually the son of Richard V. Gotti. Richard G. Gotti, his son. Now, according to the feds, one of the more serious charges involved in this indictment involved Vincent Gotti. According to the federal government, they would allege that on May 4th, 2003, Vincent Gotti allegedly instructed his nephew, Richard G. Gotti, to kill an individual called uh, Angelo Mugnolo. Now, Mugnolo was the owner of a bagel store in Howard Beach, Queens. And according to people that knew the situation, it was alleged that Mugnolo was carrying it on an extramarital affair with Vincent Gotti's wife. Now, down the road, it was largely believed that that was a lie in allowing Vincent Gotti to take out Mugnolo. According to the feds, it was alleged that Mugnolo was approached by Vincent Gotti in a business partnership. He declined, and Vinny Gotti said, you know what, I'll just go kill this guy. So he would instruct his nephew to do the deed. And on May 4th, 2003, as Mugnolo came out of his house uh, in Queens, he would be shot at by Richard Gotti. He would be shot three times but survive the crime. This would be included in the indictment. Gotti and his nephew would be charged with uh, attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Now, all in all, they would get off pretty well with this indictment. In 2008, uh, ultimately in the late stages of that year, Vincent Gotti would get eight years in prison for his role in this temp murder. Now, his nephew, Richard G. Gotti, would also get eight years in as well. Now for Vincent Gotti, he has largely been shelved from his activities in the Gambino crime family. And as we'll talk about down the road, it's interesting at one point where the Gotti name was. It's important to understand though, in the current landscape of the Gambino crime family, it is largely alleged that there is no member of the Gotti family associated with the American mafia. Vincent Gotti was shelved and unknown as to what he does now. I'd have to imagine he's just living out his golden years in relative anonymity. For large parts of his life, though, he can be credited as an embarrassment, according to people that were part of his family, including his brother. I think for John Sr., he had too many hanger-ons. And at the end of the day, John Sr. was up front. He knew what his brothers were. Most of them couldn't hold his jock, jock strap. It's that simple. Now for Richard Gotti, another brother, he had a similar career in the Gambino crime family. One though with a little bit more prestige. Richard Vito Gotti was born in 1942, just two years after his elder brother, John, was born. And they would grow up obviously in the Bronx. And as I said, in the early 50s, the Gottis would migrate to East New York. Interestingly enough, at one point in his early 20s, it was actually alleged that Richard Gotti actually would work at the old Yankee Stadium as a groundskeeper uh, at one point. Um, this would kind of be something that would set up kind of a large uh, sw swell of his life where it was pretty much unknown. These folks, both Vinny and Richard, were mostly transient people that just kind of hung on 
to their older brothers and kind of go and went wherever they went. At one point, it was also alleged that Richard Gotti actually was the manager of a social club in South Ozone Park called the Our Friends Social Club. Uh, at one point, interestingly enough, in a recorded interview, uh, in a video I talked about up here, I actually referenced Richard Gotti in a video where we talked about John Gotti's analyzed wiretaps in prison. At one point, he would call his brother, quote, a PP brain involving uh, a conversation he had with his brother Peter about a woman called Shannon Grillo, who John Gotti Sr. allegedly carried and fathered a child along with uh, in an extramarital affair. Richard Gotti was known as a PP brain. That was something that Gotti allegedly called him in that tap. Now, I want to discuss a kind of separate story, but something very much that involved Richard Gotti. For wide years in the 80s and into the 90s, um, the Gambinos controlled large parts of the waterfront, not only in Staten Island and Brooklyn. One of the main men that kicked up to John Gotti was Anthony Sonny Ciccone. Now, if you know anything about Ciccone, he was a gigantic earner at one point, was kicking up one of the higher amounts to Gotti in the Gambino crime family. He was very much in control of the waterfront. We would not hear much about Richard Gotti really until 2002 when he would actually take over the old crew of his brother, Peter, and he'd be made a copper regime in the family. This went to show you how far the family really had fallen. The once groundskeeper who managed a social club was now a copper regime in the family. Now, the reason I connect Jaconi to this story is that in 2003, the federal government would again continue their assault on the Gambino crime family and bring a wide ranging indictment down on members of the mafia. Included in that indictment were Peter Gotti, Richard Gotti, Sonny Chacon, Primo Casarino, and other members of the Gambino crime family. And the feds would allege that a lot of this had to do with the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association, and the control that Sonny Chaconi had over that ILA. Also indicted were members of the Genovese crime family. The feds allege that Chacon and other members intimidated the trustees of the ILA health plan, where basically they would be awarded prescription contracts and the mob would intimidate those trustees into basically kicking back most of the proceeds to them. The Genovese and Gambino crime family would split the uh, booty down the middle and they'd take hundreds of thousands of dollars from the ILA, ILA health plan. That was engineered by people like Sonny Ciccone. Now, also in this case, it was alleged that members of the family, including Primo Casarino, were allegedly extorting trucking companies that were associated with the ILA as well. The problem for the defendants in this case, Primo Casarino would end up flipping against members of the Gambino crime family and would be the chief witness. Now, also in this case was a bizarre story involving actor Steven Seagal. According to the indictment, members of the mafia were approached by this individual, Julius Nasso. Now, Nasso had gone into a partnership with Seagal involving a movie company. At one point, they were good friends. And I guess at one point, Seagal stiffed Nasso on some proceeds. Nasso would go to members of his family, including his brother, Vincent Nasso, Primo Casarino, and Sonny Ciccone. And in the early 2000s, the feds would allege that in Toronto, at the premiere of a film called Exit Wounds, starring Steven Seagal, the mob would approach Seagal and attempt to extort him uh, for payments of $150,000 that were pre provided for Julius Nasso. Uh, this uh, continued extortion would continue to go on. And at one point, Seagal would be eating in a Brooklyn restaurant where he would be approached by members of this group as well. At one point on wiretap, Casarino would be uh, made aware and said, I wish we had a gun on us. That would have been funny. Vincent Nasso would respond, quote, it was like it would be right out of the movies. They would joke about the ext attempted extortion. So this was a bizarre indictment. Now, back 
to Richard Gotti, he would be involved in extortion. He would actually be the go-between, according to the government, between Sonny Chacon and the boss of the family, Peter Gotti. So Richard Gotti would be hemmed up in this indictment and would ultimately get a pretty short prison sentence and get out of prison in 2005. But for the Gambino crime family, 2005, that year was a new day. It would rid the American mafia of the Gotti name and legacy. In 2005, Peter Gotti would get a long prison sentence and head off to federal prison. At that point, the Gambino crime family breathed a huge sigh of relief. They could banish the remaining recluses of the Gotti name and get rid of that name in the family. It was alleged that in 2005, Rich Gotti would be shelved from the Gambino crime family. And oddly enough, he would move to Pennsylvania, where we would not hear from him for a long time, oddly enough. In 2012, though, there would be an odd report that would come out from the Pike County Courier. Now, the Pike County Courier is a newspaper in Pike County, Pennsylvania. According to an article in 2012, um, the Pennsylvania State Police would be called to 123 Santos Drive in Milford, Pennsylvania, the address of Richard Gotti. A woman would allege that she would be beaten up by a member that lived in that home. According to the state police, a female victim was, quote, choked, causing various injuries to her chest, neck, and body. Gotti would then drive the injured woman to an urgent care office in Milford. Uh, later that day, Mr. Gotti would be arraigned and released on his own reconnaissance. It is unknown whatever happened in that case, but he would be charged with simple assault of his girlfriend. We have not heard from Richard Gotti ever since. It would largely be thought that he has spent the rest of his life living under relative anonymity in Pennsylvania. The Gotti name is an interesting one. Some of them rose to the top of the American mafia. But we remember there are large parts of the family that were involved with the mob as well that we don't talk about. The goal of this channel is to educate you on those people. According to the federal government and anyone that knows about the mafia, there is no Gotti involved with the mafia, according to my knowledge. The last time we heard from the Gotti name was when this individual, John Gotti III, would be arrested in the early 2010s after he was involved with mob rat Gene Borello in the attempted firebombing of a car uh, involving Vincent Asaro. He continues to remain in prison. Now, I am not alleging that he is part of the mafia. That was the last time we heard of the Gotti name. At this point, we can imagine, though, that the name has been extinguished from the American mafia. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit the like button. We'll see you next time.